And thank you all so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules today to join us. I'm really excited to be talking about five fundraising trends that we can keep an eye out for in 2024. Um, I am going to give a quick background on QGive for anyone on this call who is not familiar. Uh, we are a fundraising software based out of sunny Lakeland, Florida, um, and we're proudly providing support to over 6,500 nonprofits throughout the United States and Canada. And we're really excited to offer services such as donation forms, event and auction management, checks fundraising, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and so much more. And we integrate with so many CRMs and the nonprofits that we serve are always at the center of our products and our decisions. Um, and we're also really proud to partner with Nonprofit Tech for Good and the amazing work that Heather is doing. Just a little bit about me. My name is Wendy Mercurio. I am the content and education specialist on the QGIVE team. Um, so I have the privilege of overseeing our educational content, such as our research studies and our thought leadership webinars and other educational content that we offer to my fundraising friends. Um, but prior to my time at QGIVE, I was a fundraiser. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to provide resources such as this webinar to you all. And I served as a director of development uh, for a few organizations where I'm from serving child welfare and food rescue organizations. And my home base is in little teeny tiny Rhode Island. Um, an additional fun fact about me is that I am currently eight months pregnant as well and expecting my first child. So if it sounds like I'm huffing and puffing a little bit, uh, just know that I am, but I appreciate your patience, um, you know, as I might take a moment to catch my breath or have an extra sip of water today. Oh, congrats. I love all these comments. Thank you guys. <laughs> all right. So here are, is our agenda for today um, and a little bit about the fundraising trends that we're going to talk about. So we'll first go over AI and fundraising, which I know some of you might be excited for, maybe a little cautious about. We'll also be talking about reoccurring donors and giving flexibility. Then we're going to dive into peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and using that as an acquisition and donor pipeline tool. Fourth up on our list, we have unconventional donors. Who are they? How to access them? And then the last section of our webinar today, we'll talk about uh, digital wallets for easy payments and really easy donations. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to check in with all of you and kind of see how you're doing, right? It's mid-November. We are in the thick of end of year fundraising. Maybe we're just recovering from a large gala last month, but I'm really curious of how we're feeling about 2024 planning. So we're making a word cloud together today. So you can take out your phones and scan this QR code in the top left corner of the screen. Or you can join us uh, at slido.com using 4255959. Um, and I'm just curious to see what folks are feeling. I have been on total opposite ends of the spectrum. End of year comes, right? You're totally overwhelmed. You're totally, you know, relieved that it's over, that planning for the next year is just a little overwhelming. You could be really energized, excited. I love that that word is getting a lot of traction. So with the word cloud, if anyone's not familiar, the larger that a phrase or word becomes, shows that it's getting more responses from fellow attendees. And if you see um, a phrase or a word that resonates with you, you can't answer more than once. So throw that in as well to give it some um, extra responses. So I'm seeing overwhelmed, excited, optimistic, hopeful. This is great. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Clifton Strengths. My top strength is um, positivity. So I love seeing hopeful and optimism up there. Mm, stressed. It can be stressful planning for next year. I agree with you. All right. So a lot of a lot of positive trends. Okay. This is exciting. Tired already. I'm sending my love to you. Whoever responded to that, you've got this. Hopefully, maybe some time off will re rejuvenate you. We do have some folks still participating, so I am gonna. Let these few attendees type in their answer. Lacking resources, that's, that's a common trend. Awesome, okay. Well, I like that we're all feeling positive. That's a great way to start our webinar off today. Okay, thank you all so much for participating in that you know, last word club that we just did. You can keep your phones out though, because we are going to have a little bit of a rapid fire Slido session in the next few slides. 
But the first 2024 fundraising trend that I'm going to be talking about today is AI in fundraising. So first one we have is a poll. This is not a word cloud. You can only respond once. But I want to know, are you currently using AI tools to support your fundraising efforts? Yes, great. So we can scan that code, the QR code in the top left, or we can join at slido.com, whatever you prefer. There is no right or wrong answer, and you can only answer once. Looks like we might be split here, but we'll let folks get in their final responses and see where we end up. I like that we have over 50% as of now saying yes, that they, they do use AI, but it looks like no might be sneaking up. Okay, so we're pretty, we are pretty split here. I think that's, that's a good place to be going into this section today. One more slido for you all. We're gonna be creating a word cloud, so keep your phones out, but I am curious, what comes to mind when you hear AI and fundraising? So we can take our phone out for one final Slido. Um, and I'm curious as to what you're feeling. I have heard mixed responses, so there really is no right or wrong answers. Uh, you know, some folks are excited, some are curious, some are cautious that AI is coming for their job. Some are overwhelmed with having to learn a new thing. But all are totally valid responses. I'm interested. We've got a big chat GPT, which we'll talk a bit about. Excited, efficient, inauthentic. Robots. Helpful, yes. AI can be helpful. Curious. I like seeing that word up there. Skeptical. That's okay to be skeptical. Opportunities is great. Unknown territory. All right, we have a few more folks typing some responses and then we will dive into what we've got. A time saver, I like that one as well. Okay, all right, so we have some mixed responses, helpful, skeptical, inauthentic, efficient, great. This is where I expected to see some responses, so that's great. So let's start off by defining artificial intelligence. And I thought there was no better resource to call on for a definition today than ChatGPT. <laughs> so artificial intelligence is a broad and interdisciplinary field of computer science that focuses on creating computer systems and software programs capable of performing tasks that require human intelligence. These tasks can include things like problem solving, learning, reasoning, understanding. Okay, pause for a moment. Does this sound like a bunch of words to anyone else? This is buzzword soup to me. So I wanna take a second to break this down a little bit further and connect this to fundraising, right? So what is AI in fundraising specifically? How can this connect to us? So in the context of fundraising, AI refers to the use of technologies and techniques to optimize and improve various aspects of the fundraising process for nonprofit organization and other entities seeking financial support. Okay, this sounds a lot more interesting to me. I hope it does to you as well and especially these aspects of optimizing and improving aspects of our fundraising processes. And then it goes on to say that AI can be applied to fundraising in several ways, which I'm really excited to chat about today. Firstly, let's note that AI is all around us. I'm sure for some of you will be shocked that yes, you are using AI and it's not exempt from your fundraising lives. So for the sake of our talk today, I'm also going to be including automations that many softwares that I'm sure we're using are also putting in place and can really improve and optimize our processes. So I'm sure so many of those webinar today have automated thank you emails in place, right? So a donor makes a gift to your organization and they're instantly sent an email recognizing and confirming their gift. Should you have additional practices in place to recognize and thank your donors, absolutely. But for a team of one, which I have been, this is a really, really handy tool. I'm sure some of you are also using dynamic giving amounts. This is a really cool feature that many softwares offer, including QGive, uh, where we are leveraging machine learning to analyze a donor, donor's data and suggest dynamic personalized donation amounts to donors 
uh, when they're on your donation forms, and it's really going to help increase those conversion rates. Um, I always love doing donor prospect research, but how cool is it that it can be automatically done when a donor is on our donation form? I think it's so awesome. Um, AI is also used in fraud protection. I am sure so many of us have had a, or encountered someone testing a card on our website, right? So this is when a person is going to steal or obtain access to someone's credit card or a group of credit card and put through multiple small donations or make a $1 transaction. And QGIV has recently uh, offered a really cool feature that uh, you know, is detecting these bots easier now. And we've seen a 97% drop in card testing. So worth it to reach out to your CRM or whatever software you're using to see what practices they have in place. Auction item bid recommendations. This is really cool and it allows fundraisers the ability to maximize their revenue and save time with suggested starting bids and bid increments, right? To, op to op optimize their auctions performance. That's a tongue twister. Um, so even if you're looking for, you know, some inspiration uh, or where to start bidding, or it's your first year hosting this auction, this AI tool can really be a powerful asset for you. I love this one, notification for lapsed donors. So many softwares can give you a notification, right? Uh, that a donor has lapsed or is in danger of lapsing for the year. Um, I've manually pulled lapsed donor reports. I'm sure so many on this call, call have as well. And, you know, it can be time consuming and it's affected by human error. And, you know, occasionally, oftentimes, it's just a little bit too, too little, too late. Um, you know, the donor lapsed a month or so ago, and unfortunately, the organization is just out of sight and out of mind. But being able to immediately know when that donor has dropped off or is about to drop off um, is really powerful to implement, you know, a campaign for reconnection. You can also get notifications for your reoccurring donors, right? And if their card is going to expire soon. So another handy tool that not only ensures your sustaining donors are continuing to give, but it lets your donors know, hey, you know, we appreciate your monthly gift. We appreciate you. We can also add to ChatGPT, which was in our word cloud earlier, to overcome writer's block, right? This time of year, creative juices may not just be flowing like they were earlier in the year, and that's okay. We've, you know, hit some writer's block. So ChatGPT can really be your friend, right? By no means am I saying to go to ChatGPT and ask for your next fundraising appeal and immediately send it off to your printer but it can provide inspiration and get your creative gears turning. Um, but I think it's really important to, to mention and to note that all of the AI tools that I have mentioned and I'm going to mention today really need to be overseen and driven by humans. But larger scale practices that we're seeing in AI that are really cool, I think, and really, really exciting. Um, and they're going beyond the daily practices that I just mentioned, right? And not only are they helping fundraisers and fundraising efforts, but they are also providing support to program staff and to clients. So chatbots, right, for donor and program support. Fundraisers are deploying bots on their donation page um, where they can answer any frequently asked questions from donors. And then whatever question is asked beyond that bot scope, is being forwarded onto a staff member. So nothing's slipping through the cracks here. And we're also seeing uh, these bots support organizations, uh, program and mission efforts. So I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Trevor Project. I hope you are. They're a wonderful organization. Um, and they're a suicide prevention and crisis intervention nonprofit that provides 24 seven support to LGBTQ youth. And something super cool the Trevor Project has implemented is they have launched a crisis contact simulator. So counselors, which are 100% volunteer counselors, are trained using machine learning. And this tool is simulating uh, digital conversations that they may have with youth in crisis. And so this is allowing the Trevor Project to train more volunteers, right, to serve more clients that really need the support. A very cool uh, fundraising AI trend that I think is probably my favorite is grant writing assistance. So I'm going to kind of cover two frontiers of grant writing here, right? 
we have finding the grants and then we have writing and sending in the application for that grant. So there are resources out there that can help you identify the correct grants for your organization and your funding needs. I personally use a platform called Instrumental. I'm sure there's people on this call who are also using Instrumental, which is so lovely, um, where you're able to filter by location and area of need, even dollar amount if you're you know, interested in filtering maybe a smaller $500 grant that's not worth your time. Um, but this research phase can really be tough to navigate for a beginner or for a small team. So it's a total win to have this database um, immediately accessible. Okay, so we have now found the right grant. We found the perfect funder for our organization. And then we open up this application and it's literally 20 pages long. What, what can we do about this, right? So there is an additional software um, called Grantable. I'm sure there's other probably similar ones as well. Um, where you're able to put in the RFP that you are seeking support for and responses are going to be automatically drafted um, using AI. Again, should you immediately send this off to your next big potential funder? Absolutely not. This needs to be seriously reviewed and potentially majorly edited and that is okay. Um, the point is that we have saved ourselves really significant time and I joke and say maybe a few trips to the orthopedic surgeon because of carpal tunnel or arthritis from these really lengthy grant applications that are really, really common. We can also optimize our organization's presence on social media. So there's a whole slew of platforms that can track your social ROI, uh, including mentions of your organization, trending topics in your particular space. It can automate responses to common comments on your social media pages, provide all sorts, of ins all sorts of insights, and it can even let you kind of have a peek into competitors' um, social media presence and analyze their performance as well. Using AI, we can also create a more meaningful donor journey, right? So we can segment our donors using AI and really tailor our communications to their specific preferences. Donor segmentation and prioritization, this goes hand in hand with the donor journey, which we just chatted about. So an AI donor segmentation can really go beyond uh, the typical segmentation that we're able to do. So AI will group your donors together based on shared characteristics, engagement levels, uh, program that your programs that they're interested in. And it can also analyze their behavior. So do they attend your events? Are they opening your emails? What do their communication preferences look like? And we can also use AI to apply lead scoring based on our donor's likelihood to contribute or engage with a specific campaign or event. So there's a lot of exciting things that AI can help you do, all while having huge benefits to your organization. And QGIV launched a sustainable giving report this past August. Um, and the findings were really interesting. And I'll include it in the follow-up email that will be sent out. Um, and this graph here really is just a tiny, tiny little aspect of what this report covers. Um, but we found that fundraisers are pretty consistently overwhelmed with their workload um, and they're working with limited or not enough staff. So AI can really help you overcome this feeling of fatigue and burnout that might be normal for you. So we can free up your limited time and allow you to focus on other tasks, can help you really make powerful data-driven decisions and it's going to increase your organization's efficiency and save you money. And we don't have to worry, it's not going to take our job. <laughs> and it's so important to ensure that real humans are making the decision behind all of the AI tools. So especially as fundraisers, it's so important not to lose that personal connection that lies at the center of all of our fundraising success. We never want to underestimate the importance of donor relations, right? At the end of the day, nothing is going to replace the relationships that you have with your funders and your donors. And donor, donors are motivated to give because of that handwritten thank you note that they receive from the classroom, you know, or the kiddo in classroom three that now has school supplies because of their gift, right? Donors are motivated to continue supporting because of that personal thank you call that they received from your executive director or your board president thanking them for their gift. 
nothing is going to replace those moments of like true personal connection. It's also important to mention that oversight is crucial. Okay, so we have all of these tools in place that I just mentioned, right? Is it time to kick our feet up on our desk and relax and take a you know, little vacation? Absolutely not, right? We have the responsibility to continuously uh, manage and oversee the quality of work that these AI tools are producing. AI has bias, we have bias, mistakes happen. We really need to be ready to mitigate those mistakes, um, but also constantly evaluate for biases and adjust accordingly. It's also important to understand privacy risks. So anytime we are providing machine learning or AI with information, we need to be cognizant that we are not oversharing. So our donors are providing us with their confidential uh, information, and we have the uh, important job to keep that information secure. So before we move on to our next fundraising trend of 2024, I wanted to uh, you know, end it off by sharing a bit of lighthearted advice from our friend, ChatGPT. <laughs> so get ready to sprinkle a dash of AI magic into your fundraising recipe for 2024. Think of AI as the sugar in your fundraising tea. It sweetens the deal and makes everything smoother. Just remember, AI might not know the difference between a virtual high five and a real one, but it sure knows how to maximize those donations. Cheers to a year of tech savvy fundraising fun. Awesome. Okay, so next on our agenda is we're gonna be discussing reoccurring donors and giving flexibility. As I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier in the year in August, QGIF published a sustainable giving report. Um, and one section of the report covered was reoccurring donors. Um, we found some really interesting data. You can scan the QR code now. You don't have to worry about it also because it's gonna be in the follow-up email. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, but one of the sections that we covered was reoccurring donors. And we found that most organizations are supporting reoccurring gifts, so that's great to see. But we also found that donors are feeling the effects of inflation, right? So donors shared, 75% uh, of donors shared that they have uh, had inflation negatively impact their finances. But we also found that 80% of donors are still giving in the last three years. So donors are prioritizing their giving um, in the organizations that they support, and that is really exciting to see. Reoccurring donors is a way to kind of offset that cost of living crisis that a lot of us are facing. And of that, 73% of fundraisers are hoping to gain reoccurring donors. We also found that 55% of fundraisers are hoping to retain their current reoccurring donors. And the top strategies um, for getting these reoccurring sustaining donors are targeted asks and specific campaigns. So 46% answered targeted asks and 41% um, have been specific campaigns. Something very interesting is we found that 27% also have no strategies. Um, to obtain these reoccurring donors. So there is a bit of a disconnect happening um, between the 73% of fundraisers looking to gain additional uh, reoccurring donors and the 27% with no strategies in place. So 2024 really is the time to focus up on your reoccurring giving strategies uh, because there really are so many benefits for your organization. So why are we focusing on this, right? Why is this important next year? So giving plans and reoccurring donations are easy for donors. I always say that reoccurring donors are like your biggest fans. They're your organization's BFFs. Um, but, you know, they are there for you month in and month out. And this style of giving really is easy for donors. So they can put their card information in, submit all of their information, submit the donation, essentially turning it on for a set amount of time. And they can sit back knowing that their work is done. Um, and they've provided that ongoing support to your organization and have peace of mind that comes with that. Subscription spending is also the norm. I'm sure everyone on this call has some type of auto debit transaction that's leaving our accounts each month, right? It could be a streaming service like Netflix. It could be uh, a monthly purchase of shampoo on Amazon, or I know for me, I have my dog's pet food scheduled regularly. 
Um, this form of spending really is the norm for donors and they're comfortable with it. And so we can mimic this at our organizations as well. I mentioned earlier, we can also offset this cost of living crisis. So as we all know, times are tough, finances are stretched thin for many. Um, and this is actually a topic that the sustainable giving report covers in depth. So if overcoming this is a hurdle that your organization is facing, I absolutely recommend you dive into that um, in the follow up email. But reoccurring giving provides your donors the chance to still have an impact, but at a pace that is financially comfortable for them. One moment. <laughs> All right. Recurring donors um, are also going to provide increased revenue for your organizations, donors that give on a scheduled basis. So unsurprisingly, I'm sure, donate more. And we can also foster really strong relationships with younger donors, which we'll talk a lot about later on. Recurring donors tend to skew younger. Uh, a lot of folks reach out to QGive asking for resources on how to reach that younger generation. So here's one strategy to do that. Um, and we can also allow additional touch points with our donors, right? These extra moments to stay in touch are so powerful. And we're able to say, hey, Wendy, because of you, we were able to do X this month, or we were able to do X this year. And following suit here, right, these additional touch points foster better donor engagement, better donor retention, and uh, reoccurring and sustaining donors have the best uh, donor retention rates. Reoccurring donations are sustainable fundraising practices, so these are consistent and reliable funds that we know are going to be deposited each month. And these sustaining donors are also more likely to leave your organization in their will and provide legacy gifts, which I think is super interesting. So it may take some time to really develop a robust reoccurring giving program, um, but the long-term benefits for your organization are tremendous. I love this example on the screen here from Special Olympics, where they are giving their donors the option to break up uh, their yearly membership into different levels throughout the year that's just more comfortable for those donors. So where are we going to start implementing reoccurring donors and giving flexibility, flexible giving strategies into our 2024 plans? We can start with, what are we going to call them, right? Reoccurring giving or reoccurring givers or sustainers is the norm, but we can get a little bit more creative, right? We could think friends of blank or partners of blank, whatever connects to our mission. I've seen some really creative um, ideas that folks have had, but more inclusive and friendly names just really foster a deeper bond with the mission for these donors. Storytelling, as we all know, is so important in fundraising. So let's not forget about this in our monthly giving uh, strategies. So are your donors providing classroom supplies for a kiddo or the necessities for a shelter pup, right? So make sure the amounts that you're selecting are really tangible and they're what your donors can connect with. Let's also make monthly giving easy, right? So let's ensure it is on our donation forms, it's on our mail appeals. QGive even offers a little nudge saying, hey, multiply your impact and make it monthly. Um, and make sure your forms are short and concise so we can reduce decision fatigue in our donors. I would also encourage you to consider a web page dedicated purely to reoccurring donors reoccurring giving, excuse me. So you can create a donation form just for monthly giving um, and you can amplify your storytelling efforts. You can include really impactful images. You can answer any FAQs that potential reoccurring donors or your established reoccurring donors may have. And then also ensure that we're promoting monthly giving everywhere, right? It can be in our email signatures, our newsletters, our appeals, our social media. So ensuring that this is being seen by as many folks as possible really increases uh, your chances for folks signing up and participating in reoccurring giving. We also want to promote our social on social media and use text to reach our younger audiences. We'll dive into this a little bit later on, but if reaching a younger audience is a goal of yours, uh, you really want to ensure that you're on social media and your reoccurring giving asks are mobile. 
And finally, oh, no, not finally, got one more after this. <laughs> we can ensure our reoccurring giving us are mobile friendly, which we just chatted about. This goes hand in hand with being on social, but younger generations are going to be turned off by a form that is not user friendly or not the best web uh, site preferences. And finally, we can plan ahead for our donor retention. So having a plan in place at the beginning, right, will really ensure the donor journey of our monthly givers um, is, as, is as wonderful as it can be and ensure their retention before we even dive in too far. Okay, so next up, we are going to be discussing peer-to-peer -peer fundraising as an acquisition and donor pipeline tool. So I know on this webinar today, we probably have different levels of uh, fundraising knowledge and experience and expertise. So I just wanna briefly explain what peer-to-peer -peer is um, in its most simple definition, right? So simply put, peer-to-peer -peer is a fundraising strategy that allows your supporters the chance to fundraise on your behalf. So it can include an individual or a team fundraising page and will often have the ability to be customized. And then fundraisers are you know, able to create a page and share with their network and raising funds for your cause or just for an event. And um, because of this strategy, peer-to-peer -peer really extends the reach of your organization in a really organic way. And it's a fantastic tool for fundraisers to feed their pipeline of prospective donors at all giving capabilities. And it really does a great job of um, you know, giving your followers the opportunity to create um, really meaningful and long-lasting relationships on your behalf. And there's so many benefits to raising funds with peer-to-peer, -peer, or you might call it DIY fundraising or network fundraising, and it allows you to engage with your volunteers in a new way. It's gonna expand your mission and the outreach in your community. And you're also giving your supporters an opportunity to come together and meet new people with a shared interest. Um, but I think the most impactful really is organically creating that brand awareness in your community. Um, I can hear through this webinar, <laughs> some of you asking, Wendy, why now? And one stat that I really love to share is that on average, uh, nonprofits can expect 300 new donors when running a peer-to-peer -peer campaign within that year. Um, so QG have looked across all of our plat platforms and peer-to-peer -peer drove 50% of new donor interaction. So that really is huge. So you may be thinking, I don't have time for this in my 2024 plans, or you know, my donors are not going to engage with this or just not knowing where to start. So we can take a deep breath. <laughs> I know that feeling of being an overwhelmed fundraiser and having another thing added to your plate. And we can approach it um, from the mindset and understanding that DIY and network fund fundraising um, truly is for everyone. Uh, it's gonna engage your supporters in a fun and creative way. And DIY network fundraising is budget friendly and easy to implement as well. And it's gonna allow all technical and skill levels uh, to participate while attracting new donors to your organization. So no shock here, right? We're big fans of DIY and network fundraising at QGIV and for many reasons, right? It's gonna eliminate the burden of cost and time which we know are two things that fundraisers are often lacking. Um, and it will allow flexibility for supporters regardless of their location or their schedule. Um, and DIY network fundraising allows you to meet your supporters literally wherever they are. It can also be paired uh, with an already existing fundraising event that you have in place. I love this example here from City Team where they are asking their constituents, you know, will you fundraise for us? And it provides uh, you know, different reasons or purposes behind these fundraisers. So a sobriety milestone or a wedding, uh, this was offering COVID support at the time. And these examples really are gonna meet so many more of your donors where they are and have them fundraising for the reasons that truly inspire them. And it's a way to have really awesomely engaged peer-to-peer -peer supporters. So peer-to-peer uh, -peer is also an amazing generational engagement tool. Uh, I'm gonna provide a little background on QGIVS generational giving report. So this was published with the intent to better understand donor preferences and expectations um, based on their generation. And we've all witnessed the 
rapid change in the nonprofit space, right? General sh generational shifts are happening, wealth transfers are happening. Um, and we were really curious what this meant for donors and what it meant for fundraising, especially. So I encourage you all to go read it. I'll include it in the email tomorrow. I love this study and I wish I read it when I was a fundraiser. Um, there's so many amazing data points in it, but it also provides uh, personas of each generation and tangible takeaways with engagement strategies uh, based on that donor's age. Um, but let's specifically dive into how different generations engage with peer-to-peer -peer campaigns um, and if they're willing to fundraise for you or not. So we have Gen Z, right? These are the folks born between 1997 and 2012. 84% of Gen Z are willing to raise money for their favorite causes. So that is really exciting to see. I hope you're all excited for that. Um, and millennials, these are the folks born between 1981 and 1996. 79% of these folks are also willing to raise money on your behalf. Next up, we have Gen X. They're a little less willing, still somewhat interested, um, but not as much as our Generation Z supporters or our millennial supporters. And finally, we have baby boomers. These are the folks born between 1946 and 1964. They're not so interested in supporting you with peer-to-peer -peer efforts. And that is okay. We have other you know, ways that we can engage this demographic. Um, and that'll be outlined in the study as well if you're interested in that. So I wanna introduce you all to my friends, Zach and Chelsea here. These are our millennials born between 1981 and 1996. This is where I fall in. Um, and let's talk about their preferences and their motivations, right? So these folks are visual and online and they really, really love impact stories. So ways that we can keep our millennial friends engaged is to gather testimonials from our clients, keep our website up to date. This group is gonna be put off by sloppy online presence, broken links, other errors that can accumulate. And we can also ensure an easy user experience um, with our peer-to-peer -peer pages and our donation forms to really connect with Zach and Chelsea and other millennials. Also important to note that this group they're texters, right? So we want to use text as a way to engage these supporters. And we also want to allow them the ability to collect donations and connect with their friends or their network during a peer-to-peer -peer campaign via text as well. Millennials are often referred to as the forgotten generation, but I don't think we should forget about them in our peer-to-peer -peer efforts. Okay, next up we have Gen Z. So I'd like to introduce you to my very young, hip and cool supporters, Sophie and Aiden here. Sophie and Aiden are Gen Z and they are born between 1997 and 2012. Um, and there's definitely quite a bit of overlap between our Gen Z and millennial preferences, especially with peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, again, this group is gonna be very aware of your social media presence. Uh, this generation is most likely to give because of a social media campaign and being philanthropic is really important to these kids. They are motivated by ongoing and continued support and are very willing to fundraise on your behalf. So this generation is known for their activism um, and they're already changing the philanthropic landscape as, as we know it. Um, like millennials, they're going to be turned off by poor social media presence and poor website presence. Um, but the biggest takeaway I can give you all for Gen Z is, you know, do not neglect this demographic. We're going to talk about them later on. Uh, but this generation is really passionate about changing the world. Um, they're online and they're active. And I encourage you to do the same so you can meet these philanthro kids, as they're called, where they are. I would love to share a really quick example of this, um, of a school in Connecticut case. Uh, seventh graders set a goal of raising $4,000 and they were looking to support Islamic Relief USA. Um, at the time, Islamic Relief USA was uh, supporting the really devastating earthquakes that happened in Turkey and Syria this past February. And so the seventh graders, you know, wanted to raise $4,000 and they ended up raising $45,000, which I'm sure is probably higher than that um, at this point. So really impactful um, generation here and folks that we want to stay and get connected with. 
All right, fourth up on our 2024 fundraising trends, we have unconventional donors. So who are these unconventional donors that we may not be focusing our time on? Hint, it is not Oprah and Mackenzie Scott, even though your board members probably think it is. Um, but I want you to think of influencers um, and local celebrities in Gen Z, right? Local celebrities and influencers can really increase your brand awareness tremendously and create what I often refer to as the halo effect, right? So members of your community will see a local news anchor or a popular influencer or blogger supporting your organization and think, hey, I want to do the same. So here on the right is a picture from a virtual gala I offered in 2020 with a really local, beloved um, news anchor. Um, Gen Z, which we chatted about earlier, uh, they also have the ability to change the world and change your organization. So both Gen Z and these local influencers and celebrities have the ability to increase your organization's brand awareness. Uh, they make really excellent peer-to-peer -peer supporters and they can extend the outreach of all of your fundraising events. So we'll start by talking about um, unconventional donors and influencers and celebrities. Um, this is a screenshot I have of a local meteorologist um, who was the MC for a volunteer competition that I hosted um, for a few years called Mission Impossible. Um, and I did say pasta. It was a yearly bagging competition that our organization put into place after receiving a 30,000 pound donation of pasta. Um, but Chelsea would promote the event on the news. She would go on Instagram Live and she was just a wonderful host and partner um, for the event. And it was a lot of fun and she was a perfect fit. Uh, but getting started, you know, I think it's important to know that, you know, these, these folks and these celebrities and influencers are more accessible and they're closer than you may think. But I recognize that knowing where to start can be a little bit tricky. Um, first, we want to ensure that the personality is a good fit for our organization, right? A local food reviewer or a food blogger working in tandem with a food pantry, that's a great fit. That's a wonderful thing. But some personalities and some missions might not mix as well, and that, that's okay, but it is important to recognize. And I think it's crucial to lean on our staff and our board members and our committee members and our volunteers to see if relationships are already established. <laughs> some of that hard work might already be done for you. So check in with your connections and just see where relationships lie. I also encourage you to plan far in advance. These folks have busy calendars. And so if we want to have any chance to partner with them, we want to get on their calendars nice and early. And let's make their participation as easy as possible. So creating social posts for them, providing them with an outreach or promotional calendar, anything that we can do to amplify their time and their support that they're giving to our organizations. Okay, so we've talked about Gen Z, but we're gonna talk about them <laughs> a bit more. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this group is really highly motivated to support philanthropic causes, right? So a third of respondents see philanthropic support as part of their legacy. And we found in the generational study that Gen Z are vetting the um, organizations they support by checking impact reports and the organization's online presence. Um, so this includes your social media and your web pages. And no surprise here, these folks are preferring digital payments. 29% are giving, preferring to give via text. 33% are giving in response to a social media call to action. Um, so what are the ways that we can attract and retain Gen Z donors? Um, which we, again, talked a bit, quite a bit about, but I do a few final strategies for you all, right? So let's get mobile and ensure our donation forms and our website and our social media presence is up to date. Keep them engaged. Our Gen Z supporters are expecting additional and regular updates, more so than their uh, older counterparts. And we can also help them help us, right? Provide Gen Z the opportunity to participate in peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers and to get out there and solicit their network, have that large impact that they're looking to have, but their wallets might not be able to keep up with this time. And let's not ignore this group, right? We can view our relationship with these philanthro kids as a long-term investment for our organization. They probably are not going to be our biggest donor this year, probably not next year, but they could be our Mackenzie Scott in 25 or 30 years. Lastly, up today, we have digital wallets for 
easy payment and donations for our donors. <laughs> so why will digital wallets be important in 2024? So digital wallets um, include platforms like PayPal, Venmo, Apple Pay, and Google Pay. Um, so some really interesting stats out there that came from a recent Forbes article found that 53% of Americans are using digital wallets more than traditional payment methods. Also found that 47% of Americans spend more when using digital wallets um, compared to traditional payment methods. And 51% of people say that they would stop shopping with a merchant uh, if they didn't accept payments such as Venmo, Apple Pay, Google Pay, uh, whatever that uh, consumer's preferred um, wallet was. So what can we learn from this and how can we transfer it to our fundraising efforts? Firstly, over half of Americans are preferring to use digital wallets. So I'm interpreting this as I need to accept digital wallet payments to meet those 53% of Americans where they are. Americans are also spending more using digital wallets. So hopefully this is going to transfer to donations as well. And my organization will be able to, you know, receive larger gifts with these digital wallets. And finally, over half would stop shopping if digital wallets weren't offered or accepted by a merchant. So I can assume a donor may do the same thing and stop supporting my organization if digital payments um, were not accepted. So why will digital wallets again be important in 2024? Primarily being used by younger and more tech savvy consumers. This is an exciting way again to entice those younger donors. It's gonna increase donor trust and safety. Names such as PayPal, I believe PayPal is the second most recognized and trusted brand in the world. Um, so donors are gonna feel safe using this type of donation form. Next up, we have ease of use and convenience is king for these donors. Um, and it's an easy and streamlined checkout experience, right? Digital wallets are going to allow you to make a donation in just a few clicks. We're going to decrease that chance of donation form abandonment. So your conversion rates will hopefully increase using digital wallets because this style of donation really is so easy. Um, and it's quickly becoming an essential feature, right? It's not necessarily a nice to have, but more of a necessity. So a few things to keep in mind as we begin preparing for next year, for 2024, I can't believe we're at the end of the year, but we can connect with younger donors, um, this generation of upcoming donors, um, by ensuring our fundraising strategies are current and accessible. We can meet these donors where they are by embracing peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and digital wallets. Important to note that fundraisers are stretched thin and expectations are high. Embracing AI and everyday work can free up time for priceless face-to-face -face donor interaction and time spent on curating bond with Gen Z donors is an investment in your organization's future. These philanthropic kids um, can have great impact today and in the future. So thank you all so much for tuning in today. I appreciate your time. I hope you learned at least a few strategies that you can take with you into your 2024 planning. Um, and I welcome any questions that you may have. So let's see, I'm gonna go to the Q&A now. Did I say grantable? Yes, I did say grantable. Um, they've had a lot of traction and the other platform I use for accessing grants is called Instrumental with no A at the end. So it's just Instrumental with a TL. Can you please share the names of platforms mentioned by the speaker? Um, Pavni, I will include them in the follow-up email for you because I mentioned quite a few. Um, how do you overcome the natural inertia of donors to engage slash help in a peer-to-peer -peer campaign? Um, are you looking for ways to like motivate your peer-to-peer -peer donors? I'm assuming, um, I, I always had great luck with providing them with, uh, you know, a, a peer-to-peer -peer kit, right? So we were provided all of the social media needs that they would have, outreach needs, scripts, whatever it was. Um, will there be a recording of this webinar sent to us? Yes, there will, Brandy. Um, Rebecca Parker is asking, what are some RI social media AI tools? I know there's one called Meltwater. There's quite a few, um, but I'll link some in the follow-up email for you, Rebecca.
Um, besides ChatGPT, are there any other AI fundraising platform tools? Um, Christopher, I mentioned Grantable, ChatGPT is a great one, Meltwater you can use for social, um, and then I'm sure there might even be some in your CRM or whatever platform that you are using. Ways to motivate them to ask a Google. Beth, I also had great, uh, Beth is following up on her question on motivating peer to peer supporters um, and you know, even hosting a kickoff event, right? And maybe inciting a little bit of friendly competition is a great way to do so. Um, and if you have a peer to peer supporter from the past that was really successful, uh, maybe implementing them as a bit of a coach so you can connect these new supporters um, with this more experienced peer to peer supporter. Is there a fundraiser platform that will connect with Wix that we can use? Brandy, I am not familiar with Wix, unfortunately. Um, so I cannot answer that. Um, all right, I will give just a little bit longer in case anyone else has a question. I don't see any more coming through. I do want to take a moment to thank all of you so much for taking time out of your um fundraising schedules to spend an hour with me. I had a lot of fun. I want to thank Heather so much for hosting as well. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck in your 2024 fundraising adventures. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.